Namaste, sir. How are you? Namaste. Yes, I'm fine. I'm Welcome. very happy to be in India. It was a very tiring few months in uh, in Europe, and um, everything becomes normal again once I come in uh, Indira Airport. Why is there uh, anything unusual happening there in Europe? No, I mean that's just in my private life. I have I had a lot of things uh, okay. to to worry about, and now that's mostly okay. solved. And so, how is your health now? Much better. I mean, not that it's important for anyone, but so it is important for us. The the last few years, I wasn't very well. Yeah, I had all kinds of. Uh, you know, d- different diseases at the same time on my joints, mm. especially, and um, danger zone for diabetes. And uh, of course, I have the all the complications that follow from my heart transplantation. Mm. But still, it's 16 years ago, and I'm doing fine. I mean, I'm I'm not in danger. So, uh, but I mean, now everything has gone a lot better mainly due to more physical exercises, including Hatha Yoga. Okay. I mean, I've done that for a long time, but only at a distance. Now I've taken it really serious and it has effect. Mm. The COVID experience was something because a lot of people were saying that comorbidities that you have, so many of them that will impact so uh, did you have covid or i have had covid okay <laughs> i've i've i mean you see our group of transplant patients um get uh called to the hospital for vaccination anyway okay so i didn't really consider what quite a few people do is to refuse to cooperate with the whole thing and um so i i had three vaccinations um, nevertheless, after the second vaccination, I still had, uh, COVID. Mm. I had the real thing. I was lucky. I was probably the first one in my country to have this Omicron variety, oh, okay. which is much less serious. Yes. So some of the symptoms I, I never had some, of course I did have, and it was very recognizable, but nothing dangerous. I mean, good to know. Yeah. So, but, 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 uh, comorbidities may be, um, uh, after the second vaccination, I had an otherwise inexplicable attack of arthritis on my left hand for a whole month. Uh, and so I couldn't use this hand, this hand I lost the use of because of another (laughs) operation I've had long ago. Uh, which m- meant that my hearing nerve mm. and my equilibrium nerve on the right side were severed during an operation, not by accident. It was inevitable, but, um, but so, I mean, you can see it when I walk down the steps, see, I have a hard time finding my, uh, balance. Mm. Uh, but, um, so. One effect, of course, also is that I couldn't write anymore. And so now I've more or less relearned that, uh, all that. So, so I used mostly my left hand and then I couldn't use that anymore either because of this, uh, arthritis. Then after my third, uh, you know, booster, um, vaccination, I, uh, had yet more, I had all these joint problems and quite a few, one after another, or even at the same time. Exacerbated by hmm? the COVID experience or the Well, vaccine. I am not sure. I mean, and of course now many doctors are going to say, no, 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 you, you shouldn't make that connection. connection. And of course I, I'm not being a medic. I can't make that connection hmm. responsibly, you know, but I, I noticed that people around me have been saying, oh, look, look, that's what happens when you get the vaccination. <laughs> well, so I don't know. I mean, this whole vaccination thing, I mean, I guess they did what they could. Nobody knew exactly what the situation was. Mm. Uh, so it was a big experiment. Some people say you shouldn't do experiments on entire populations. Again, I, I mean, it's something I, I have no opinion about. I have opinions enough, so <laughs> that'll do. So coming to the opinions enough part, yeah. uh, while you were in Europe, 
a lot of discussion was happening in india and mm-hmm. you must be looking at it very amusingly that people were discussing so passionately about what should be the name of the country yes bharat or india and given that you have written so much about it what do you think about this whole issue yeah well um the name india of course is indian enough you see it it comes from the greek uh pronunciation of the persian pronunciation of sindhu mm. in arabic al hind or in chinese into also come from there um and you see those words are not really foreign because they ultimately come from sindhu which is river and so it simply means people living on or beyond the sindhu river uh but yeah i mean if you think that's too foreign um at least you see this is a word used in a foreign language english now the chinese or the germans or the greeks or the finns are not demanding that outsiders use their own name for their own language mm-hmm. or for their own country you know nobody outside china says jungwo respectively deutschland respectively hellas respectively uh, suomi which is finland uh so they don't care what others make of it you know in their own language of course they use their own term now you could say in the case of india yes english is a foreign language is a colonial language at the same time today de facto it is also an indian language so and and of course the the indian government has not demanded that outsiders also use bharat but if they themselves do so you know i mean it's a pretty innocent matter uh so if they invite people to a speech by the president of bharat you know they are perfectly free to do so now what are some of the arguments used by the opposition parties against that um the um well the, the the great bugbear of indian public discourse is secularism <laughs> yes so they say yeah but you see india at least is safely secular that's true i mean it refers to a river a very material thing it has no ideological uh, connotations but that's not the end of it <laughs> uh in the case of india you could get away with it yeah. there's another term for india which is hindustan uh that is also a secular term although some people have been saying in the course of that discussion that that is a is a religiously colored term that's not really true you see hindustan has the persian suffix for geographical places or it's a stan and then preceded by hindu which is india or which is an indian and for them uh, for thousands of years it didn't have a religious meaning mm. it simply meant india now the word hindu of course acquired a religious dimension once the muslims brought the word from persia into india and then it came to mean an indian who is not a muslim uh, so uh, in spite of what the rss nowadays says that every indian is a hindu in fact by definition and since the very beginning not every indian is a hindu the word hindu <laughs> precisely differentiates between muslims and non-muslim indians Mm. it is purely a negative definition it means an indian unbeliever it doesn't say what they believe you don't have to believe in reincarnation in order to be a hindu you don't have to practice vedic rituals and so on you see all these differences between brahmins and buddhists between upper and lower caste between uh, urbanites and tribals and so on that's all not important from an islamic viewpoint they all go to hell mm. 
You see, that's what unbelievers do. <laughs> they, they go to hell. <laughs> Not that you should mind, mm -hmm. uh, because Hindus will have a good time in hell. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, hell is like an eternal, uh, ya, um, Agni Hotra, an eternal fire <laughs> ritual. And moreover, the landlord in hell, you see, he's a fellow with a trident and <laughs> with him too, you will feel at home. Um, yes. So, uh, all these people are the same. You see these, these, these specific differences about Atma and Anatma and so on. The, the Muslims are absolutely not concerned with that. Like for instance, the Muslim historian Minhaju Siraj, when he describes the destruction of Nalanda, he calls the Buddhist monks clean shaven Brahmins. Hmm. So you see all, uh, all the Ambedkarais who say, yeah, the Buddha was an anti-Brahmin revolutionary and so on. Somehow they hadn't noticed that. Neither have I, but that's a different <laughs> matter. But you see the Muslims themselves made no difference between all that. Uh -huh. um, okay, anyway, so the word Hindu acquired a religious meaning or a, a second meaning because the, the meaning Indian also remained relevant. Mm. Uh, so in the modern age, this no longer applies. Hindus are everywhere and non-Indians, people without Indian ancestry, like Tulsi Gabbard in the United States can be Hindus. Um, but so historically, uh, the, the word Hindu is still confined to India. And so a foreigner, even if he believes all the same things and does all the same things would not be called a Hindu. You see, some people now, like David Frawley, for instance, who are effectively Hindu, can also be called Hindu. Now, I specifically do not call myself a Hindu. Mm. And um, there are different reasons for that. And it's not because I have anything against, <laughs> against the stuff you people do. Mm. Uh, but so one reason against it is precisely that geographical consideration. Okay. Not the main reason, but it's also there. Mm. Um, okay, but so the word Hindu has acquired this religious dimension. The word Hindustan has not. When the Muslims ruled India, they still called the country Hindustan. Mm. When, when under the Sultanate or under the, the Mughal Empire, they went on pilgrimage to Mecca, they would introduce themselves as Hindustani or Hindu. And um, so that is a perfectly secular term. It, there is a paper called the, the, the Hindustan Times, very secular. You know, if the word Hindustan had not been secular, that would not have been the name of that paper. Okay. Uh, you have the name Jambudweep in, uh, from the Puranas. Uh, this means the, uh, the land mass of the blackberry. Uh, that's also a perfectly secular term, just like uh, India from Sindhu. Uh, now, as for Bharat, however, watch out. A at least secularists should watch out. You know, because, you know, there are hidden meanings or connotations. It's like with the anthem. Hmm. You see that the Muslims supported by Jawaharlal Nehru opposed Vande Mataram as the anthem because they said it's idolaters and it worships uh, Durga and so on. Uh, well, Jana Ganamana is very similar because you see, it, it talks about the Jana Ganamana Adhinayak, the, the commander of the people's mind and about the Bharata Bhagya Vidhata, the dispenser of India's destiny. But it doesn't say who this is. And so at the time of writing, this was just before the visit of King George to India, which was then his colony. And uh, this, was at a con this was first sung at a Congress meeting, which was in preparation precisely of that visit. Mm. And another song sung at, for the first time at that meeting was indeed in praise of King George. But this song was not, and in, in a letter, Tagore has explicitly denied that it, it was in honor of King George. Um, now, if you read the whole, the whole text, not just the first stanza, which is the official anthem, then it becomes completely clear. 
You see, the third stanza is about the uh, the divine charioteer, mm. who yuge yuge. The, the the verse is literally from the Bhagavad Gita. From age to age, you see, whenever dharma is is faltering, then I come back to restore dharma. Yada yada hi dharma se mila nirbhuti Bharat. So um, then, then the next stanza is about the, the protective mother, the combative mother, and so this is about Durga. Mm. And then the final one is about the, you know, the eternal guide, the guru, and so on. This is about Shiva. So who is the dispenser of India's destiny? It's the Hindu pantheon. Mm. And so Tagore, being from the Brahma Samaj, you know, he was not too much into into idol worship and so on. He doesn't name them, but you know, you can clearly see what he's talking about. And um, so if you want to oppose uh, Vande Mataram, then you should on the same grounds oppose Janakalama. Mm. Now I hear the same thing. Uh, the word Bhara seems perhaps secular enough, but who is this Bharat? Okay. Yeah. This is named after someone. Y- you know, of course, the epic, the Mahabharata. From the Rigved or from yeah, the... Yeah, yeah, okay, that, it comes. Yes. But, you know, the Mahabharata yeah. um, is, is the third version of that same epic. Originally, it's called Jaya. Then it becomes bigger. It becomes Bharata. And then it becomes very big. And this is a Mahabharata. Okay, so it's the great epic of, of what? Bharata. Of the Bharata dynasty. Now, the Bharata dynasty, in which there is a, a war of succession between two branches of the family, which happens in royal houses all over the world, um, about that the epic has been written. And so it has a historical core, although much embellishment has grown up around it. Now, this dynasty, where does it come from? These are the descendants of a number of famous ancestors like Kuru, uh, who founds Kuru Kshetra. Uh, but it goes back beyond that. And uh, you end up with a certain Bharata. So Bharata is the Sanskrit derivative of Bharata. This is a not uncommon boy's name. Um, it is a... Uh, a verb form of the root bhar, which is uh, fer in Latin or uh, bear in English, mm. to bear, where from born, for example. Um, so to carry, to maintain. And this is said about fire. Now, you know, you have taboo topics, like in many languages, the word bear is not expressed, is replaced with some circumscription so that you, you, you know, you, you avoid the taboo of naming the bear by, by its name. So here, similarly, uh, fire, yeah, there is the word Agni, of course, but there are also uh, circumlocutions, you know, to avoid being too direct. Mm. And uh, like, for instance, you also have the name uh, Bhargu. Bhargu yes. is an onomatopoeia, a sound imitation, of the sound of the fire, of the flames. Okay. And so this is also a name that means fire. So Bharata effectively means fire. And and that's a normal name in a culture where they worship the fire, you know. Can you hear that? They worship the fire, you know? They're idolaters. Yes. You know, I mean, they don't worship sculptures. Maybe that's more literal idol. But at any rate, they worship something that is not Allah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this boy, you know, was born and he got the name Bharata. And then he grew up and he did something important. You see, the country is not named Bharata because of this word meaning fire. You know, although that's also instructive, but that's not exactly why this boy was important. No, he became important because he effectively founds the Vedic tradition. Um, the first uh, poet of a Vedic hymn is Bharadwaj. Uh, according to tradition, for what it is worth, he was the adoptive son of King Bharata. At any rate, he comes 
is a bit younger than Bharata, according to other sources, a few generations younger. At any rate, it's in this circle of Bharata's court that the Vedic tradition begins. Mm. Now, poetry, of course, existed already for a very long time in even very, uh, well, non ad less advanced cultures. You already have poetry because that's very easy. You don't need any material for it. You don't need any instruments, you know, except language, which, you know, everybody has. And um, so the tradition of poetry very certainly already existed. And you can also see from the oldest Vedic hymns onwards, it's very sophisticated poetry. And so, so it really clearly builds on an existing tradition. But what is the new thing? It is that this poetry is memorized and they see to it that it really doesn't get lost. I mean, you for fun can learn a poet, poem that you like by heart and when you die, it's nevertheless still forgotten. Mm. Uh, so here they make sure that this is perfectly preserved. There are all kinds of mnemotechnic devices to, you know, keep it exactly as it is, to pass it on exactly as it is. And so that's the Vedic tradition. Now the Vedic tradition becomes very important. Many Hindus say that everything is from the Vedas. That's not true. You see, India is a big place. There are different traditions that are not Vedic, like what you see in India everywhere these days. Uh, temples with uh, murtis that are being worshipped. Um, that's not Vedic. That's nowhere in the Vedas. Uh, the tradition of asceticism, of meditation, that's not really in evidence in the Vedas, except a few times in the third person, like you have the hymn of the Munis, the Keshin hymn, the hymn of the hairy ones, mm. where the Naga sadhus are described. You know, that they're, you know, living on the outside of society, walking naked and in the wind and so on. And so they know about yoga, that's very clear. But they themselves are not these ascetics. The Vedic poets are elite people. Mm. They live in the court. They're part of the circle of the king. And... Um, so they live in a culture in which some notion of yoga is present. You see some yogic ideas here and there in the Vedas, mm. like for instance, Dirgatama's uh, imagery of the two birds in the, in the tree where one is eating from the berries and another is simply looking on. Just like you have the contrast between uh, pravriti, taking part in worldly life, and nivriti, abstaining from the world. Uh, so some of these ideas are already there, but overall, <clears throat> the Vedas are not about yoga. Mm. That's another element of Indian culture. And so all these different traditions get, get uh, all integrated together. And the Vedic tradition has the honor of becoming sort of the framework that integrates all these together. Mm. And so you'll get the Sanskrit terminology for all the uh, components of the puja culture, for all the components of the meditation culture and so on. But so that's the Veda that integrates non-Vedic elements. You also see that the Vedic tradition becomes the backbone First of all, of ancillary literature, the Brahmanas, the Upanishads, yes. which become very philosophical and in fact, a level of philosophy that has been recognized by many outside philosophers as the greatest that mankind has produced. It also uh, becomes the center around which a number of sciences grow. You know, some sciences that exist everywhere, like astronomy, hmm. Uh, some in which India is much ahead of the rest of the world, some branches of mathematics, um, some which remain uniquely Indian till the modern age, like linguistics. And so with all this, you see, the Vedic tradition attracts an enormous prestige. So the, the Bharata dynasty starts in Haryana, Ilaspada is uh, east on the east side of the Saraswati River. <clears throat> but it doesn't stay there. And so 
all kinds of political events happen, military events. And one is a very important one, which is this Battle of the Ten Kings. Uh, King Sudas, who is the employer first of Sage Vishwamitra, then of Sage Vasishta, he conquers first in the east into western Uttar Pradesh, and then he conquers in the west, uh, West Punjab. And uh, in fact, this Battle of the Ten Kings takes place on the Ravi River, which is now the border between India and Pakistan. Mm. So it was in a way, 5,000 years ago, <laughs> the first Indo-Pak war <laughs> ending in an Indian victory. <laughs> uh, but so then you see- It was more like India, Ura Iran. Yeah. More like India, Iran. And so, and yeah, well, that's exactly what it was because the enemies of Sudas were the ancestors of the Iranians. Yeah. Now, um, so from that point onwards, the, the Bharata territory, the territory of the of Bharata's dynasty, is like much practically northwestern India. Mind you, it's not all of India. Uh, some Hindu nationalists say that no, no, you know, India is Sanatana, is eternal. That's not. Mm, that's exaggerated. Uh, at that's, least the Vedic India is not. Well. Exactly. So you it, see, there you have the Vedic India uh, that that can meaningfully be called Bharat Varsh. Yes. Um, the first use of the term that I know of is in the uh, Vishnu Gumpa inscription, I think, from the first century. And there still, it only means northwestern India. Yeah. So the actually the boundary that is mentioned. Yeah. It is. It doesn't go beyond, say, Madhya Pradesh and say yeah. in that also beyond Ganga. So that area is quite limited. It's not yeah. uh, matlab, Himalayas to ocean. Right. That, and so, comes, that yeah. comes, I think, in Vishnu yeah. Puran. Right. And um, the the expansion of this dynasty doesn't doesn't go on. You see, this is this is what much they conquer then. You know, you have, you have this internal war, which becomes the Mahabharata. And so politically, you see, they've reached the limit. However. Um, and interestingly, the geography yes. also mm -hmm. of Mahabharata and the Battle of Ten Kings yes. of this dynasty is quite the same. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, you see Kurukshetra, where yes. the battle takes place, is practically the same place as this Ilaspada which is the, the navel of the world and, you know, the center of the best place on earth and so on, according to the Vedic seers. Mm. Now, um, so yeah, it's definitely that dynasty. So it's a continuation of Rig Vedic history. Rig Vedic history ends with Veda Vyasa, um, who is the uh, biological grandfather of the Kauravas and Pandavas. Yes. Um, I mean, he's a sperm donor, if I may say, Yes. for his uh, half-brother, Vichitravirya, who dies. Mm. It's, a, it's a Niyogi uh, procreation. Yes. Um, now, and so the last person to be mentioned in the Rig Veda is Shantanu, who mm. is the great-grandfather. So he's the stepfather of Veda Vyasa. And of the Yajur Veda, the last person to be mentioned is uh, Dhartarashtra, who is the biological son of Veda Vyasa. Only the Atharva Veda that takes a few generations more. There, the last person to be mentioned is Parikshit, mm -hmm. who is the, um, let's see, the grandson of Arjuna, which is the great, great grandson of Veda Vyasa. Mm -hmm. But so it's around that time, so you see, um, from the Vedic period, you effortlessly move over into the Mahabharata. Okay. However, you should see that the Mahabharata has been written over a very long time. Yes. Just and like, just like with uh, Rig Veda. Yes. And uh, because exactly. you see the transition also, as you have also said that when you talk about the initial books mm -hmm. of Rig Veda, yeah. the first one starts from West Uttar Pradesh. And yeah. then eventually the geography, the flora and fauna, the knowledge of that moves towards Afghanistan. Yeah. So the later books referred more to the geography of Afghanistan. Basically, they know mm -hmm. that place. Right. And 
it's in the beginning they don't they mm-hmm. only talk about say west and uttar pradesh geography yeah. haryana and then they move east uh, westwards yes exactly but you see one uh, effect of this long duration is that the perspective of the poets changes mm. and so while the political expansion of the bharata uh, kingdom stops the cultural expansion you know really takes off because now you see because of the increasing prestige of the vedas which ends up being being divinized being seen as a divine revelation you know everybody wants to be part of it mm. and so rather than conquering places they are being invited you see the kings in the south give these agraharas and so on they give all kinds of facilities you know tax facilities and so on to brahmins if only they want to come and settle just to give the the prestige of the vedic traditions to to their dynasty mm. and so culturally the whole subcontinent becomes vedic and so the name bharatvarsh can then meaningfully be extended to the whole subcontinent which is what it does so there you have a few uh historical details that we have to be critical about like the later poets uh but still you know their work is still inside the mahabharata they back project this extension to the whole subcontinent to the episode where the pandava brothers go on conquest and conquer everything unite india mm. you know so the unifier of india is not queen victoria you know it's not even uh, chandra gupta or so no 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 it was already arjuna and those people mm. well that i don't <laughs> i mean i have a hard time believing that um though it's interesting that one of the conquests goes all the way up to kirgizistan mm. you know to uttarakuru because and indeed you see outside india there was a lot of hindu presence yes. and the later ex, uh, expansion of the Bud- of buddhism uh, builds on that already existing hindu presence mm. um uh, that's why you know the muslim conquests of india practically start first with the muslim conquest of afghanistan and that area. which was mostly hindu and yeah. buddhist populated exactly so um but all anyway, these anyway so yeah. so that extension to all of india should not not if you're doing serious history at least be back projected onto the time of the mahabharata battle but at least it is achieved it is culturally achieved even and the project politically. started with this this dynasty yes. which is named after bharat exactly so, so if is... you name a country bharat varsh it does not just prosaically mean uh the country of the dynasty founded by some ancient king who had a little you know a little kingdom in some little part of haryana you know that's not important mm. i mean why is it not called let's say kurukshetra yeah you see the field of king kuru mm. no it, that's not what it called no matter how important he was or any other king they can't match what king bharata did Mm. they didn't found the vedic tradition yes so if you call a country bharat varsh or just bharat what you are effectively uh, saying is this is veda land mm. so 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 a <laughs> secularist would have to reject that okay now coming to this whole bharat or king <laughs> yes now people say okay this guy started the tradition vedic tradition and he came from europe or he came from russia basically the aryan invasion aryan migration mm-hmm. theory that there was this beautiful uh, hadappa kingdom or uh, uh, society with uh, mm-hmm. in, in indus saraswati civilization uh, saraswati came later of yeah. course they don't even agree used to agree that saraswati existed so this whole uh, civilization existed before the vedic tradition and these kings so called so the bharat including because he founded the mm-hmm. dynasty and the bharat varsh so the tradition also so he is an outsider mm-hmm. and that has been used to justify okay this if he can do that then why not say 
Mughals, why not uh, yeah. Britishers? So all that. So, so we will just go to Aryan invasion migration theory because invasion. I think I don't know if some but some credible. I'll explain. Uh, credible people still believe in that. Mm-hmm. But what is the existing credible theory, uh, both out of India and Aryan migration theory? Mm-hmm. Let's not talk about the history that when it was this, then they mm-hmm. falsified this theory, and then yeah. we came to this. Let's start with what is the today, what is today's credible theories? Yes. Okay. And what are the sup- suppose, okay, well, supporting evidence for that? I'll start where most Hindu polemicists start. Yeah. You see, they say, "Oh, it's a colonial concoction." Now, uh, and 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 the other side says the same thing. You know, the out of India theory is a Hindu nationalist concoction. Mm. Now, <laughs> you see this whole idea of concoction is so funny. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely a conspiracy theory. You see, it says, no, what you see is not what you see. There's something behind it. You see, they are using all these linguistic and archaeological arguments, but in fact, it's a political ploy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, so, you know, you, you have this politician, you know, he comes home from some tiring day in parliament and he lost the debate and he sits down and he says, what am I going to do to fool my enemies? <laughs> Eureka, I have it. I'll, I'll start a scholarly theory so good that all the people of the discipline itself are going to buy into it and going to propagate it. Mm. Yes. Now, you see, that is not how it works, you know. And so so that's not how it has gone. Now, I admit, of course, that there has been political use of the theory. Yes, because... Like like the the, the point you make, you know, if the the Vedic people have conquered India, then why should not somebody later conquer it? That point has quite literally been made by Winston Churchill. Yes. You see, against the the, the rising uh, freedom movement... He argued, well, we have as much right to be in India as anyone there, Mm. except maybe for the depressed classes who are the native stock. So that's exactly the Aryan invasion theory. So you have the natives, they were conquered by these foreigners who put them down, you know, put them in the lowest castes. And so the caste system is a sort of apartheid system with which You know, the the newcomers try to impose their rule and their racial purity. Mm. So, yes, politicians have used this theory, but that's only after the theory has come about. True. If you want to refute the theory, it's not good enough to say, oh, look at what politicians have done. No, I agree that it is not concoction, but it has been, for for example, once it came into the picture, uh, the Britishers thought it very convenient for them to use it and divide the society yeah. because that was their like, that was their basic principle mm-hmm. that you have to find all these fault lines and divide yeah. and the same is being carried forward by the western academy also mm-hmm. and our people when they discovered this that this is not the whole picture when they sort started seeing this evidence of out of india theory they also they like whatever evidence comes we have to ignore that and we have to prove this theory yeah, exactly. because this suits our thing so it's I'm just saying that forget all these people. Mm. Let's see which theory has credible evidence in its support. Okay. Now, as for uh, immigration versus... um, Migration. No, no, versus invasion. You see, migration is not a good term. Aryan migration theory, that says nothing because there was at any rate a migration. Either a migration into India or a migration out of India. I mean, there are some people in India who deny even that, who says, that, you know, I mean, who deny that there was any either movement into India or movement out of India. But that's they don't genetically want to have proven. anything to do with anything outside India. And they, I mean, I've, I, I've, I've been through that discussion many times. Um, you see, it's like, you know, if you say, no, 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 there was no immigration, but there was an emigration, now this they, they they suspect some 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 trick you know by these wily westerners <laughs> you know they, they can't get india by saying that there was an immigration but they still want to keep the door open by saying that there was an immigration mm-hmm. and, um, and and so you see being nationalists 
anything that happened outside the 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 the, 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 the Khyber Pass, you know, whether it is immigration or emigration, they don't want to know. For them, India is enough. They want to close that door. Yeah, they should have closed that door when they had the chance. But so, <laughs> literally, yeah. But so, realistically speaking, if you study the you know the relation between those languages, of course, there was a migration either into India or out of India. Now, uh, so this term AMT, Aryan migration theory, that I completely reject. However, as for Aryan immigration theory, well, an invasion is, of course, a form of immigration. So I don't care. And anyway, the abbreviation is the same, AIT. Now, the fuss that they make is that um, they want a scenario without a military aspect. Uh. Uh, so this, you know, an earlier generation of, of scholars whether of one school or the other, took it for granted that there was some military event. You know, why do they speak English in America or Spanish in South America and so on? Why? Why do they speak Russian in Vladivostok, far away from where the Russians originated? Because well, the because invasion of happened. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, like, you see, even some of the Aryan invasion scholars, they mock this new tendency of denying invasion and emphasize, oh, no, 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 immigration. Like uh, you have this French uh, scholar, Bernard Sergent. Uh, both his parents were in the French resistance during the Second World War. So he knows the role of conquest. You know, of course there were conquests and there was you know, fighting against it and uh, all kinds of military aspects in history. And imposing ones. And, and so, so you see, he finds this very funny that people are so squeamish, you know, oh no, the you know, invasion, that's toxic masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you see, of course, you know, and, and then especially in this case, you see here, you're talking about the greatest population concentration at that time on earth. You see, far, far bigger, you see, geographically and certainly demographically than Egypt or Mesopotamia. Mm. So you have the biggest society in the world, and that would, you know, accept the language and the religion of newcomers just like that. You see, I mean, in America, for example, I was conquered by, by the British. Then a majority of non-British people came in, but so while coming in, they all adapted. Mm. You know, they remained Italian speaking for one or two generations, but ultimately they all became English speaking. And so that's, that's immigration, that's not invasion. Initially what the, what the English did was invasion. That's why they imposed their language. What the others did was immigration. They did not impose their language. Now here, the scenario that you're looking at is that the biggest society in the world at that time gives up its language and its religion for no reason at all. Mm. Now that's very unlikely, you see. Conquest is a far more credible scenario, but even that would not be enough. Like the Mongols, they conquered practically all of Asia. And yet today, Apart from Kalmukia, part of the Russian Federation, there is no country that changed linguistically from its own language to Mongol. Yeah. You see, everywhere the Mongols adopted. In Iran, for example, the Ilkhans became Iranian speaking, became Muslim. So they fully assimilated into Iranian society. And so that's what you would expect those Aryans to do. Mm. And effectively, that has happened in history. Yeah. See, nowadays they talk a lot about uh, genes. They say, oh yeah, but there is, I, I don't know, 17% or so of Indian genes can be, tra at least um, uh, male genes, it has to do with Y chromosomes. And yeah, so they, they say that in this caste, this percentage yeah. is 50%, in this right. caste, this is okay. 30%. So, yeah, so, so you see, overall, I, th I think it's 17%, at least a percentage, you know, is traceable to Central Asia. It, of course, also depends on what time you, and so on. But anyway, I perfectly accept 
that a part of the population came from Central Asia. And we know that from history, long before there was genetics, we already knew that the, the Scythians had come, the uh, Huns, the Greeks, the Kushanas, the Turks, and so on. They all brought their genes into India. Mm. And these genes are still there, you know, geneticists can find them. But they didn't bring their language. Or, you know, like the Italians in America, they brought their language for a few generations and then it dissipated. And then they all became Indo-Aryan speaking. Um, even for groups that are still, that have kept their group identity, which then is, is still traceable today by geneticists. Like the Jats have a very high percentage of Central Asian genes. Who are the Jats? The word Jat is a Sanskritization of what is in Greek, Getai. So the Getai is a Scythian, is an Iranian tribe, mm. uh, known, famous in history because they defeated the founder of the Persian Empire, Kyros, in 500 something BC. Um, and so a number of them came to India, settled here. And so this name became Jat. But, and, and they retain their genes, they remain recognizable as something special, not the same as the rest of Hindu society, yet they completely adapted. They took on Hinduism, they took on uh, Hindi. Is that uh, an established thing? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That they trace their origin from those Scythians? Uh, well, the, from some Scythian tribe, that at any rate, that's not, not in doubt at all. Okay. That they are the descendants of the ones who defeated Emperor Kuros. I don't know, maybe that's not very certain. I mean, I, I, at least, you know, among scholars, I hear wide descent to it. Okay. Um, but so at any rate, they come from Central Asia. And, um, and so they did not do what the Aryans are supposed to have done, namely to impose their language on a far larger society than, what they, than their own tribe. And incidentally, they inhabited the very land, very geography that was the land of, say, uh, uh, yeah, 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 the original Vedic country. That's where, where the Jals live today. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, West UP, Haryana, yeah. Punjab, and some parts of Rajasthan. Right. So it's very interesting. And similarly, so mm. many like people have come, Huns have come, yeah. and uh, like every. Third or fourth century, people yeah. came from outside. So it's that is not new. And everybody, except say after uh, Muslims came, everybody integrated yeah. into the society, whether they became separate castes. Say, uh, like it's very controversial to say maybe they became Rajput, some became some yeah. in invaders became Gujar, some became something. Yes. So all these different castes, maybe the composition is different. And even the Muslims, you see, even though they have an ideology of separateness, they only maintain their separateness in matters of religion. But linguistically, they also adapted. Yeah. You see. Either like in Kerala, for instance, they simply became Malayalam speaking, uh, or you see their Urdu is a variety of Hindi. It's not Persian, it's not Arabic, it's certainly not Turkic. Mm. Uh, so even they adapted. But that is because the adaption did not require any, like they didn't come in hordes that way. The people yeah. were natives only. They were from here. Those well, who were that's, that's another discussion. Um, you know, Mohan Bhagwat said that uh, by DNA, Hindus and Muslims are the same. Yeah. Now, first of all, of course, that's not important. You know, there are, True. like the Mahabharata is between cousins. Yes, they had the same DNA. <laughs> nevertheless, they were still enemies. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's not so important. But, but nevertheless, you can ask the question, yeah. do they have the same DNA? Now, some Muslims especially the, the elites are going to say, no, no, we are foreigners. Yeah. And so you have a lot of Urdu literature where this is said very explicitly. True. Like by, by Hali and so on, by the famous Urdu poets. Um, so basically those Ashrafs versus that. Yes. Now, Ajlaf. even among the Ashrafs, of course, they too have the same DNA because hmm. you see, uh, sometimes the foreign descent is only a claim they make. 
You see, if some Muslim businessman 200 years ago became successful, he thought, oh, now with my new status, I deserve a new ancestry. And so he called himself Sharif okay. or uh, Sayyid, which means a direct descendant of the Prophet himself, or Quraishi, which is an Arabic descent, or Khan, which is Turkic descent, hmm. uh, the most common name in, in Pakistan. Um, so sometimes these foreign ancestries are false, are invented. But in many cases, they are genuine as far as I'm, I, I'm not going to fuss over whether this is false or not. Let them be descendants of some original Arab or Turkic invader. Well, what did that Turkic invader do? And this is already centuries ago. Okay, he took native women, whether he bought them in the slave market or he just grabbed them in a raid or he actually married them. Uh, at any rate, these children were half Indian. And their children were three quarters Indian. And their children were seven eighths Indian. And uh, so, of course, their DNA is mostly just Indian, just exactly the same as of their Hindu neighbors. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, they, they got integrated. Yeah. Mm. So, anyway, we were talking about the, yeah. the theories. Yeah. Invasion, immigration, yes. and okay. Out okay. Of now, so why do people object to the term invasion? So one thing is indeed just a, a, a cultural evolution hmm. that this this military is is not emphasized anymore because it it is another insult. Yeah. It is seen as another insult that okay, like yeah. initially also we were invaded, but there is another reason, a more practical reason. Namely, you can't prove an invasion. I mean, they've tried enough. Yes. You see, there, there have been very well-funded excavation campaigns for a whole century yeah. to find this Aryan invasion. They haven't found it. Nothing at all. This is also admitted by the invasionists themselves. Mm. So, and it's not that there was nothing military in Harappa. You see... I mean, much less than in other civilizations, but still you do find fortifications and so on. Um, and there was one time of uh, strong military upheaval around, I think, 2700 BC, around, not at the time of the supposed Aryan invasion. Mm. Uh, but still, you do not find the trail of outsiders coming in. Now, you do not find that in a military form. You do not find cities being burned down and so on. But you also do not find it in a, in a peaceful form. You see, you don't see people bringing in uh, new material implements, new burial practices or what things that are uh, archaeologically traceable that can be traced back to some place in Central Asia. Mm. So, um, whereas in the opposite sense, uh, a, a new development, uh, the discoveries by um, this Russian scholar Alexander Semenenko, where you find more and more signs of migration, but in the opposite direction. And, and, and this is entirely logical. What you evidence see, like? Well, you see, the, the Harappan uh, people were traders. They went places. Mm. They had trading colonies in Mesopotamia. And the, these continued, you see, all the way to the Roman age. You know, you, you have the first Christians destroying Hindu temples in Syria. Yeah? So, you see, there was this very strong presence also in uh, Oman, in Arabia. Mm. And then, indeed, in Afghanistan, like you had a colony in Shortugai, uh, for the exploitation of uh, lapis lazuli mines. And mm -hmm. so, so, so the Arabans went around, also the and so much of their trading goods, especially their jewelry, mm. then already India was famous for jewelry, you see, was taken out through Central Asia, Mesopotamia, even Egypt. And technologically also, yeah. uh, at that time, mm -hmm. there was no contemporary civilization that was as advanced yeah. as, say, Harappa. Mm -hmm. So the narrative that 
other outside yeah. who can conquer usually happens when there is a superiority mm-hmm. of culture of yeah. tools that it was not there well you could say that you see i mean archaeologically i am saying that yeah, yeah. at that site nobody has found that advanced mm-hmm. civilization in other places that yeah. was there in india mm-hmm. yes exactly um you could say well a primitive people can concentrate on military prowess like what the mongols did mm. you see they were you know very outside uh, society That's looked true. at from from china or iran uh, yet you see they conquered these places yeah. but the typical thing is that they didn't leave anything there mm. and uh, or like the 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 goths and the vandals and so on who conquered the roman empire they did they are usually cited as a counter example against the idea that you have to find traces of invaders so you see they didn't really invade anything they had for instance already converted to christianity even before they conquered rome mm. um so you see they didn't change anything like they, they left all the roman institutions in place there was a new boss at the top but otherwise everything remained the same mm. they took over the language and so on they brought in a few loan words but they kept you know latin as the the operative language mm. so um so linguistically yeah. at least mm-hmm. we can't say that either way whether we out, went out or whether they came in no 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 that's 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 a different issue okay. we were just talking about archaeology so i'll finish that but the point okay. i want to uh, bring across is that um there is no trace of an invasion nor even of an immigration okay and uh so semenenko argues and i think more and more convincingly that there are many signs of emigration but okay let's say that that is still in the balance that the jury is still out on that but at any rate there's no sign of an immigration uh that's for sure now that is archaeologically based yeah. on archaeology yeah. now we will come to linguistics yes okay um the out of india theory is the original uh theory about the geography of the indo-european family once the indo-european family as such had been discovered mm. so actually yes this was the original theory yeah <laughs> many people don't know that yeah yeah of course you see you, you see all these invasionists they ah, ah the ugly vicious hindu nationalists well you see the the uh the theory of the indo european language kinship dates uh from officially from 1767 there were already a few writers uh who had some some impression of a kinship already since the 16th century mm. a few individual writers they had no influence at all but then the french jesuit um gaston le grand cardou in 1767 sent a paper to the academy in paris in which he showed in detail the kinship between latin greek and sanskrit one of the first to hear of it was voltaire the famous french, uh, french free thinker and uh, he immediately publicized it so already it became became publicly known and immediately in and out of india sense mm. and so he explicitly says uh european culture comes from the banks of the ganga mm. so that's not a hindu nationalist no that's like one of the great minds of the French european liberals. enlightenment yeah. and several others follow like immanuel kant uh then uh, it is most explicitly uh, elaborated in the book um language and wisdom of the indians by friedrich schlegel in 1808 so this is already 40 years later and still the out of india theory is the dominant one Uh now of course some people already explore other possibilities. Uh you have first of all the Christians whose importance in this debate is much exaggerated in India. They was come up with this theory that you know creation only took place in 4000 BC 
Mm. That was there. That that of course was a present. I wouldn't exaggerate it too much because precisely the people who worked on it were like scientific brains and not too biblical. Although then again, you see the Oriental studies initially in in the universities mm. were placed with the theology department, and so often you see these are people that were prepared for work in the mission. And so they learned Hindi or Arabic or Japanese or so to prepare them for the mission. Mm. And so in, in that case, you see, the biblical influence was not negligible. But still, like in the Catholic world, this idea of a literal interpretation of the Bible was not there. Mm. And that's already a very important section. Uh, so I wouldn't exaggerate that. But nevertheless, their, their presence was there. And so what did they say that the original homeland was? Well, Armenia. Yes, because uh, after the flood, you see, Noah had landed on the mountain Ararat in uh, Armenia. Mm. And of his three sons, it is Japheth, who is designated as the ancestor of the Indo-Europeans. So we all come from Armenia. Um, so that was another theory. Now, this is a very interesting one because coincidentally, for completely non-biblical reasons, actually after the Indian homeland, the popular one came back to that region. So around the Caucasus, either north of it, where there was the re recent favorite, or south of it, in Armenia precisely, mm. or northern Iran. That's, that's the new favorite. Uh, but so uh, there were different theories, and so the dominance of the Out of India theory weakens from about 1820 onwards. I think the tilting moment is... Uh, a book or a publication by the brother of Friedrich Schlegel, who mm. had, you know, extolled the India as the homeland. His brother, August Schlegel, uh, proposed the Caucasus. And so, so that's where it has practically remained. So mostly north of the Caucasus, the Yamnaya. Yamnaya is Russian for and this grave, so that that culture. Ukraine. Well. Yes. Okay. Um, or close to it in Anatolia mm. or in Armenia, Iran. Um, so by about 1850, the out of India theory was gone. And so there are two important nails in its coffin. One is uh, linguistic paleontology. Mm. So this is the idea that from the vocabulary of an ancient language, you can see what kind of life they were leading, okay. what environment they used to live in. Now, what they found was that it has had to be probably in Western Europe because there were some Western European words like beech, the beech tree, which I don't think you have in India. And so that's a West European, France especially, mm. a Western European tree. Um, and so the word was present in in Latin, in, in Celtic and Germanic languages, so all Western Europe. And then Northern Europe, because of a number of species that belong in a cold climate, the bear, the wolf, um, the uh, also some trees and so on. So that, that, that just seemed also settled. Now, strictly speaking, if you think again, and indeed you see linguists later have criticized it uh, to this effect, uh, this is not really decisive because if people move from one climate to another, either they forget about those words or they give a new meaning to those words. Mm. Like the, the beach word also exists in Greek, but with the meaning of oak. And because there's no beech trees, but there are still trees. And so the word was kept and, and you know, had another meaning. Or it may have gone in the other direction. I mean, that's precisely the point, you see. With linguistic paleontology, you really aren't sure. Mm. Moreover, you know, when, when in Europe they think of India, they think of, of sweating hot. 
Now, some parts of India are cold, yeah. namely around the mountains. So you have, for instance, the birch tree in, in Kashmir. You have wolves, uh, you have bears. In fact, I learned from Sri Kantalage that you have the most, you know, the highest number of different bear species in India. Um, so again, you see these cold climate species do not exclude India. Mm. Anyway, but so at that time it was thought that, oh, this is a decisive element. India is out of the race. The second one is that, um, well, let me first say the fundamental one, the one that brought about this shift away from India is simply that they saw that Sanskrit is not Proto-Indo-European. Sanskrit is already a daughter of Proto-Indo-European, even though perhaps the eldest daughter. Okay. Um, so what, what Gerdu and so on had seen is that Sanskrit is clearly an older language than Latin and Greek. Mm. It has a more complete form of the Indo-European grammar. Mm. Like in Latin, you have five cases of the noun, or six in Greek, five, in German, four. In English, only one. Um, whereas in Sanskrit, you have eight. In most languages, you have only two numbers, singular and plural. In Sanskrit, you have three. Um, so, and it's not that Sanskrit acquired what was originally fewer in, in Greek. No, because Greek and Latin also have remnants of this dual number or of the locative case and so on. Like, for instance, the Latin word domi, which means at home, is a locative case of domus, which means a home. Um, so there are some remnants. So you can see that the language is originally had it. Mm -hmm. So Sanskrit is closer to the original form. But it is not identical with the original form. Mm -hmm. You can see some cases where Sanskrit must have changed. Like... Um, the, the shift from k, k to ch um, and, and from, um, from, from g to j. Uh, you know, that's a typical shift that happens in languages all over the world. Like for instance, Beijing was originally Peking. Oh, yeah? very cool. um, this is unidirectional. This is always a, a, a shift in this sense from k to ch. And so later on, in the Indo-European languages that don't have this shift, mm. later on this shift nevertheless took place. But Latin, that can happen like anywhere, no? Yeah, yeah, of course. It can happen anywhere. But yeah, yeah. And in fact, that's a very important argument. Nevertheless, at that time, they thought, and indeed I agree that it was not a very sharp reasoning. Yeah. Um, they went by impressions. So they thought that... Since there is a distance, a, a linguistic distance between Sanskrit and Proto-Indo-European, mm. there must be a geographical distance yes, between right. the homeland and India. Now, that's really not valid uh, because languages change even while staying in the same place. Yeah. And, you know, the English of today is not that of Shakespeare, is not that of Chaucer. Um, so... That's not really a compelling argument. Nevertheless, at that time, it, it worked. So then you have this linguistic paleontology, and then you have a non-linguistic argument, a literary argument, namely the Vedic testimony for the Aryan invasion. So, Vedic testimony? Yes. You see, you could say, well, linguistically, it's not proven that India is not a homeland. Uh -huh. But if they themselves say that they immigrated or invaded, yeah. what can we do? Sure. Yeah, if, if they themselves say we came from outside, well, yeah, then, you know. But where is that? Ah, well, uh, several uh, military scenes, especially the Battle of the Ten Kings, mm. um, do suggest a racial identity uh, for the parties in the in the battle, uh, it is said twice that um, 
Vasista, the priest of the Aryans, uh, is white clad. Shvitnia. From Shweta, she's white. Yeah, but white clad can be clothes, right? Well, yes, but you see, in such very ancient texts, who knows about the precise meaning of the words? Yeah. So sometimes it's translated, you can see it in the, the first translations, white complexion. See. Then on the other side, the enemies are often described as black. But you see, as even uh, an established uh, linguist like uh, Hans Heinrich Hock has shown, um, black is, should not be taken literally. Um, in, in some cases, it's not even about, uh, about the enemy per se. Like you have a case where you have Krishna Twach, the black cover, Mm. which is about something else, which is simply about the night, which lies over the earth like a black cover. Mm. Okay. But some, sometimes it is about the enemy. The enemy is described as black. Now, does this mean that the enemy had a black skin color? Mm. Well, in the second world war, the enemy was also called black. You see, I mean, I, I know you see, in my childhood, I, I know that the adults at the time, you see, they were all very conscious about who in the Second World War had been a white or a black. Okay. You see, a white meant somebody of the resistance or somebody, you know, strongly so it on didn't the refer side of to the, the allies. Skin the, color. No, not at all. So the blacks were those who sided with the Axis. Because all were whites. Subhash Chandra Bose, the Japanese collaborator, in British security reports, he's described as a black. Hmm. So you see, you don't have to go back 5,000 years. You know, you, you go back less than one century and this usage was still there. The enemy was called black. Yeah. Moreover, in the specific case of the Battle of the Ten Kings, the word black is not there to designate the enemy. Hmm. You see, <laughs> I mean, here I, I almost can't help laughing because this is such, I mean, such a, such clear evidence. Mm. Um, the enemy is described as the Asikni Jana. That is the resident Jana, the of people, the tribe of... Black River. Well, Asikni means black. Okay. Okay. So this is often described as the black tribe. Mm. And uh, in, I think, uh, Griffith's translation, it is said in footnote explicitly that this refers to the black aborigines. <laughs> and that's at any rate how everybody read it. Um, now, in reality, this is about the enemy who comes from the Asikni Basin. You see, the battle takes place on the Parushni Basin, in, in West Punjab. So the, the Vedic people who are based in Haryana have already conquered a few of the Eastern Punjabi rivers. Mm. Now they are at the Parushni and their next plan, they're expanding, is to go to the next river, which is the Asikni. Mm. Now there, the 10 kings. Is Chenab. The, yes, the Chenab. So, uh, a number of tribes there feel threatened, mm. and rightly so. So they make this alliance to counter the threat of King Sudas. And this takes place at the Chenab Basin, which is then called the Asikni, which means the Black River. Now that's a perfectly normal name for a river, like the Yellow River, mm. of course, you know. Um, the Thames in England, Okay, what does it mean? Thames is related to a Sanskrit word that you certainly know, even if you don't know Sanskrit, if you know anything about Indian culture, you know this word. Thames? Yeah. What? Thomas. Oh. Dark. <laughs> the Thames means the dark river. In my country, there is a, a river called the Demer, which is you know, through the Flemish linguistic evolution, is really the same word as Thames. Mm. 
Mm. Right. And so it also means the dark river. Um, so this is a perfectly normal name for a river. So this river happened to be called the black river. Mm. So we're talking about the people from the black river okay. who are not from the East as the Aryan invasion theory would imply that the invaders move deeper into India to yeah. Southeast. Yeah, exactly. No, just the opposite happens. Sudas is expanding to the Northwest. Mm. And so he goes to the black river. And so then, nevertheless, in the 19th century, they, they read this and they said, ah, see here, the literary proof that, you know, white people speaking in the European, you know, invaded the country of the black people. Uh. And, and, you know, at that time there was the rise of this racial thinking. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, there was a certain spontaneous racism before that, not only in Europe, uh, but then racism really became a scientific theory. They basically projected their own things onto this society. Yeah, but well, yes and no. And see. there was very good reason for that. For at least the colonialists, they thought like, okay, these guys came before us mm -hmm. and did the work of so-called civilizing. Mm -hmm. So we are also doing the same. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. That is how it was used. Yeah. But you see, separately from that, you should understand that at that time, it seemed reasonable. It seemed logical. Everything fell into place. Yeah. And so racism came up uh, at the same time as the influence of Christianity went down. Because, you see, racism follows from a materialistic view of human beings. So you, you were your body. Mm. In the Christian view, like in the Hindu view, you have your body, your your soul lives in this body. At some point at death, it will leave this body. And this body will disintegrate, but the soul will remain. And so in India, you call that the jiva, and there's a whole, you know, philosophy around it and so on. There are differences. Nevertheless, this basic uh, idea in common of a non-materialistic view of men, that was being questioned during the rise of modern science. Mm. So as they knew more and more about the material aspect of human beings, they gave this material aspect a greater importance. And so they started reducing man's properties and human possibilities to his race. Mm. And so with that, you know, it all fell into place. You know, this, this story of the, the Indians own testimony of how they conquered India, you know, that, that, that seemed true enough. True. It, it was confirmed, by the way, in the 20th century when um, the Christian missionaries invented, I'm not very sure they did the first invention, but they immediately seized upon it and propagated it, the word Adivasi. Yeah, you see, the it word is still in... It's still commonly used in India, uh, in one of the speeches of Narendra Modi, I've heard it. Yes. Uh, so everybody naively uses this word. In fact, some Adivas, some, some so-called Adivasis, mm -hmm. for example, the president Murmu yeah. belongs to this tribe, which has, which is very recently came to India. Yeah. So how that became Adivasi, I, I don't understand. Sim yeah. Similarly, course, there are many tribes. Yeah, of course, the, the genetic story of these tribes, uh, there's this, um, what's his name, Chaube, uh, Gyaneshwar Chaube, mm -hmm. who has presented these genetic findings about the Munda people of whom the, the Santali tribe is a part. Yeah. And uh, the Santali tribe is the one that President Murmu belongs to. <laughs> so... Uh, he shows that the Munda people uh, immigrated into India um, from the southeast, not from the northwest. Yeah. Uh, and so their language is, is related to Khmer and, and uh, Vietnamese. Mm. The, 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 the demographic point of gravity of the language is still Vietnam. True. Now, I strongly plead against the identification of a language with uh, genes or other physical traits. Mm. And in fact, in my training long ago in Indo-European studies, 
that's something they really hammered on. Because of course, before the war, there had been this identification of the Aryan languages, the Indo-European languages, with the Aryan physical type. Mm. You know, the, you had to be tall and uh, white, of course, and uh, you had to have a back head knob. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that at first, but you know, one day somebody checked my back head. Oh, you don't have a back head knob. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, so that I, is also one of the characteristics. I'm not a good Aryan. <laughs> uh, anyway, but so the identification of the Aryans with the physical type mm. after the war is being laughed at. You see, now they call it pseudoscience. I think that's a bit unfair. That simply was the then state of science. Mm. That was the state of the art. It was still in its infancy. Uh, so then they thought this was reasonable. Later, you know, we grew out of that. But so now with genetics, this is being revived. Mm. You know, when this book uh, by David Reich and then this ne next book by Tony Joseph came out mm. some five years ago, uh, using genetic arguments for the Aryan invasion, um, effectively in the polemics in the, in the newspapers here in India, I saw your people one after another thing, yeah, but this is the Aryan gene. No, 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 no. The uh, person, you know, the, the, the skeleton, you know, analyzed from, from Raki Gari yeah, so has a Dravidian gene. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This was the argument that the, <laughs> actually, uh, the yeah. skeleton that was found in Raki Gari was of a woman. Yeah. And uh, supposedly, I don't know, like I have been told that it is not supposed to have R1A gene. Yeah, it, it, yeah, right. It's not, not from a male, you know, Central Asian provenance. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was cl classified as R1A1 is basically right. the so-called Aryan gene. Right. And whatever mixture is there is Dravidian. Nevertheless, in the case of the Munas, it is a little bit more defensible to do it. You see, in the case of the Aryans, it's a mixture, a complete mixture. And so this area where they went through Afghanistan and so on, the complete crossroads of ethnicities. And so... And, and, you know, in, in any scenario, very many people in India who didn't speak Indo-Aryan in the beginning do so now. Mm. So it's a mixture, you know, of all kinds of genetic provenances. Uh, so you can't tell from the genes of their descendants today what their ancestors spoke. Nevertheless, there is a, a better case for that in the, uh, with the uh, Mundas. Because the Mundas were not numerous. You see, one reason why people would ad uh, adopt a, uh, another language is because, well, everybody speaks it, you know. Oh, what can I do? Mm. Um, they were not numerous. They were not advanced. Mm. You know, I mean, at least not more than the people around them. Um, they were not especially rich or so. So... Most of the people who speak Munda languages today are not descendants of converts, so to speak, to the Munda languages. There was nobody speaking Telugu or Hindi or so who said, oh yeah, I'll have better chances in life if I adopt Santali. That is very unlikely. To so most of the people who speak Santali or uh, Munda or so today are descendants of people who already spoke that language when they came into India. Mm. So it's, yeah, I mean, I'd still be careful, but it's more defensible to apply these genetic findings to the prehistory of the Munda languages. So what conclusion does Chaube come to? That they came into India, in fact, precisely at the time when the Aryans are supposed to have invaded, namely around, well, second millennium BC. Okay but they came from the Southeast. Um, so, uh, President Murmo is not an Adivasi. <laughs> she's, she's a tribal, all right, she's a Santo, um, but she's not an Adivasi in the sense that she's an immigrant, mm. or at least, I mean, you know, let's not get carried away here. She's not an immigrant, you know. Even her ancestors have been here for, 3,000 or more years. Exactly. Isn't that long enough? Yeah. How many Americans are in America for 3,000 years? True. 
Um, so, I mean, this is all a very theoretical uh, discussion and it's, it's really actually very funny that in India so many people get politically worked up <laughs> over it. So uh, basically what, what is the situation today given the evidence? Where yeah. do you lean and what is the reason for that? Okay, I'll come to that. Let me first finish the, the reasoning I was putting up yeah. about the word Adivasi. You see, the word Adivasi is not older than a hundred years. And yet I've heard a number of people, including professional Indologists, professional Indo-Europeanists, use say, that word. Yeah, the tribals are the native Indians. Of course, that's what the word Adivasi says. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a circular reasoning. Um, okay, so, but so you see, that's essentially what happened when these translations of the Vedas, you know, told us that the ancient Aryans had already said, yes, we have invaded India from the black aboriginals. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's circular. Um, or like another thing, you see many people defend the Aryan invasion theory because Bala Ganga Dhara Tilak, uh, also in, in 1900 At that time, so, everyone believed that yeah, because they course. thought that West, Western science had to take yoga. Exactly. You see, even Hindu nationalists like Savarkar believed in the Aryan invasion theory, not that they were so enthusiastic about it. Because but they were because told... And they because were not of the scientists. the prestige of Western science. Yeah. Yes. So you see, he made his own version that he came from, from, from the Arctic. Um, and so now there are still Europeans, I know some, who, who use that as an argument. See, it's a Brahmin who says, you know, that they are in invasion. Yeah, well, um, so that's all very circular. Okay, today. Now, what was your question about today? So today, what is your theory that is, you think, according to you, is most credible, whether it is out of India, whether it is immigration, migration, what is your most plausible theory in this regard? And what is the evidence for that? Because we know that you, people uh, make jokes about you that you are, uh, you don't believe in genetics, you don't believe in uh, uh, linguistic okay. evidence you don't believe in. But it is not. So, <laughs> so where, because we have shown yeah. that linguistically either can be true. Similarly, genetically also, and there well, is no need to have a link between the two. Yeah. So know, what will, what the will. The linguistic evidence is not very strong either way. Yeah, yeah. You see, there are a few arguments that are really pertinent. Um, Often they are in a, in a far corner, they're not big, but actually to explain them away uh, would, be, would be very forced, very artificial. Hmm. Like for instance, um, Sri Kantalagiri's discovery that the word for wine, uh, which is generally agreed to be a loan from Semitic, so Middle East, uh, exists only in the Western branches of Indo-European and not in the Eastern ones. So Tocharic, Iranian and Indo-Aryan don't have it. And Proto-Bangani, but of that we only have a few words that may be explained away. Um, but so the Eastern branches don't have it, but the Western ones all have it. Why? Well, because on the way through Semitic territory, mm or through the territory of languages bordering on Semitic and having borrowed the word from Semitic, they borrowed the word. And, you know, an East to West movement explains it, the West to East movement doesn't. Uh, so there are some minor uh, linguistic arguments, but when I took the course of uh, Indo-European linguistics long ago, uh, that's one of the first things that our professor said that, you see, linguistics can't prove this, you know, but he said, archaeology has proven. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, repeatedly, when I started doubting then already, uh, this are in invasion theory, he said, yeah, but that has been proven, but not by linguistics. Okay. You see, everybody thinks somebody else has the proof. 
Mm. But um, so the linguistic proof is not very strong. Okay. And there are all kinds of ways of explaining it away. And there is definitely no archaeological proof. No. And so one problem is that the evidence that you need only surfaces a few thousand years later. Mm. Um, so most people think that the oldest in the European language is Hittite, some 1600 BC, although there are some loans from Hittite, some names uh, that are available in Akkadian texts. They report about Hittites. They also appear in the Bible, by the way. Um, and um, so Sanskrit, as well as Mycenaean Greek, is dated to 1500 BC or lower. And so we are thousands of years removed from Proto-Indo-European. Mm. So of course the evidence is limited. That's why the genetic evidence makes such a difference because that brings us back to the period concerned itself. What will be the clinching evidence according to you? No, it's a combination of, of you know, and, and we are getting there. You see in the West too, you know, this interdisciplinarity is gaining ground. Yeah. Uh, not always in a very balanced way. Like last year I was at a conference where the genetic evidence was all the rage, but it was a linguists conference. And so there was, for instance, a paper where uh, a scholar talked about the Semitic uh, substrate layer in the Celtic languages. Mm. Uh, this means that the Phoenicians or other Semites have traveled all the way to the British Islands, even as, as, as far north east as Hamburg mm. in Germany. And, um, and we know that they did. You see, the Phoenicians had tin mines in Cornwall. So, um, so apparently they had some trading colonies there, or maybe even real colonies. It's like with the British East India Company, it starts with trade, mm. but then they, they tend to remain there. Um, and so there was a Phoenician presence there. So you have a number of Phoenician loan words. In fact, very many in, in the Germanic languages, a few, but many in, in especially island Celtic. He's this, this scholar said, no, you see, I, I mean, and many scholars had worked on this thesis and, and found new types of evidence for it and so on. Now this scholar just wiped it off the table. He said, yeah, but you see, we have no genetic evidence of a Mediterranean presence in Ireland. What is this, you see, if the results of two sciences here, linguistics and genetics, do not converge, then you can't just throw one of them away. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to see, okay, we have a problem here. We have to analyze more deeply. We have to study. We have to find more evidence and so on. And ultimately they'll converge. Mm -hmm. uh, but so what was happening here is that, you know, linguists, after 200 years of looking for the homeland and not really finding it, just give up. You say, oh, oh, now we have the strong evidence of genetics, which is in fact exactly what the Indian scholars say. You see, they have never taken linguistics seriously. You know, NS Rajaram I'm talking about, oh, you know, it's a pseudoscience, Proto-Indo-European is a ghost language, and, uh, you know. And even recently I saw a certain Shiva Shastri say on YouTube that, uh, you see, they invented this, uh, this linguistic kinship and someone else said, yeah, yeah, Subhash Kak said, yeah, but you know, this can be explained, you know, words looking like Sanskrit present in Greek. Yeah, but that may be borrowing, you know, across thousands of, of miles uh, or, or like the, the, the the, the difference between Indo-Aryan and Dravidian, mm. which is also a linguistic reality. Yeah, but you see, there are many Sanskrit loans in Tamil. Yeah, but loans is something else. You know, there are, today there are very many Spanish loans in Quechua. 
or there are many uh, Afrikaans loans in Zulu or so, but these languages are not cognate, okay? So that's a totally different phenomenon. So you see, as a perfect amateurs, you see, they were throwing their, you know, dislike against uh, linguistics. Now that is changing. You see, finally, now that with genetics, Indian scholars are getting somewhere, see, and they're good in genetics. Mm. They're good in engineering and in medicine and so on. They've never done anything about the humanities, but in the exact sciences, they're good. And so here they are making progress. They are making discoveries that really matter in the debate. Yeah, And, and so may... now with that progress achieved, you find the, among the younger generation, quite a few who are taking in some of the linguistic evidence to the extent that they're capable of understanding it. They are very meaningfully uh, connecting it with the genetic evidence. So basically a combination of these two yeah. will eventually get us somewhere. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, if you ask, you see, which of the two theories I favor, yes. I, I first have to update you. <laughs> there is now a third theory okay. that is coming up. In the 90s, there was this theory of Anatolia as the homeland. Yes. That was, uh, that was really refuted. Mm. Um, and even the man, the, the, the great theorist of this, Colin Renfrew, has accepted the uh, Yamnaya homeland, uh, north of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea. Uh, however, one of his supporters, Paul Haggerty, linguist, using the newest methods in linguistics, more mathematized linguistics, which is, which helps explain why Indians are also now finally accepting it. Hmm. Um, he argues, I won't say he shows, but he, you know, very reasonably argues that on linguistic grounds, mind you, that um, the homeland was south of the Caucasus. Okay. Not exactly Anatolia, a bit to the east, Armenia, mm. or even northern Iran. Northern Iran, on genetic grounds, on different grounds, was marked as the homeland by David Reich. Yes. You see, here in the polemic a few years ago, you see, there were the, 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 the uh, the pro-Aryan invasion party mm. was running away with his new book by David Reich, yeah. in which indeed he argues that the Indo-Aryans came through Central Asia from the Yamnaya culture. Mm. However, he also says in the same book, the, all these Aryan invasion people in India ought to have read that, that they came ultimately from Northern Iran. Yeah. So you see, Yamnaya was a secondary homeland. The people there were in the homeland looked at from Europe. In Europe, yes, they invaded from the Yamnaya area. Mm. Very true, and this is very well documented, yeah. both genetically and archaeologically. So you see, in after 3000 BC, you get an enormous change in Europe. You get new... Um, housing types, burial types, new pottery, and so on. Complete change, and genetically, you also have this change. Mm -hmm. You see that um, there is practically a genocide of the native European men, not of the women. They are, you know, taken as sex slaves or so. Um, but so on the male side, there is a complete genetic change. Mm. So that's what an Aryan invasion looks like. There is no evidence of that in India. And there is no evidence of that in India at all. There is a complete contrast between the European situation and the Indian situation. So in Europe, yes, there was an invasion from Yamnaya. Mm. And in India, no, there was no invasion from, from Yamnaya. Now, and where am I getting at? Wait a minute. I, I'm saying there is another theory now. Mm. Um, and so David Reich already considered that possibility. Now, after Paul Haggerty's paper, you know, this really has become one of the contenders. It is that the homeland was in northern Iran. From there, a part of that community 
migrated through the Caucasus or west of the Caucasus along, along the coast to the north. There they formed the Yamnaya culture. Mm. And then from there they invaded into Europe. That's where you have the branches, Slavic, Baltic, Italic, Celtic, okay. and Germanic. Mm. South, the rest remains. That's why you have certain common linguistic developments, mm. isoglosses as they are called, uh, between Albanian, Phrygian, Greek, Armenian, Iranian, Indo-Aryan. So they stayed there until they also, you know, went their own way. So the Greeks, the Albanians went west, the Iranians, the Indians went east, the Armenians remained more or less there. Um, so what that means is that, yes, there was an Indian invasion, not from very far, only from Iran, but, but from the west. You see, they did not go all the way north north of the Caspian Sea and then through Central Asia, down to Afghanistan and then into India. No, from Iran, they went through Baluchistan into India. Mm. And so that's why, you know, now I'm, I'm pleading their case for, for a minute. Um, that's, for instance, why you have the beginning of agriculture in Mergar. Mergar is entirely in the west of the subcontinent. And so this fits in with the old theory that agriculture started in the Middle East and then spread into Europe and spread into India. Yeah, but independently, it has been established now yeah. by Neeraj Rai that agriculture in India started independently of the Iranian branch. Yes, of course, I'm not a specialist. I, yeah. I can't say I agree with that because I don't know enough of it. Yeah. But it and is very even geographically, reasonable. all yes. this Iran, this whole uh, civilization of say Indus Saraswati, this was geographically the same area. It's mm -hmm. not uh, today. They are maybe three yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, yeah, yeah, this course. whole thing was same. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it, it fits in with other arguments for the out of, uh, out of India theory. But at any rate, now let me for a minute make plausible this new theory of Armenia, Northern Iran. So uh, what they say is that there was a southern movement which uh, did not affect the Yamnaya area. So the Greeks went straight to the west. The Albanians went straight to the west. The Indians went straight to the east. So there's an almost direct line from northern Iran into India. Mm. Um, so that's a different scenario. It's already, you know, for, for Indian chauvinists, it will certainly gratify them that at least the homeland is not in Europe. And indeed, in, in Europe, I know uh, a political movement uh, associated with the French uh, Nouvelle Droite, New Right, uh, in in leftist papers like Wikipedia, they're going to say, oh, it's extreme right. Mm. That's not entirely fair. But nevertheless, they are Euro-nationalists and they are very attached to the idea of a European homeland. Yeah. And so they won't like it that even people who used to believe in the Yamnaya homeland are now moving the homeland south of the Caucasus. So... Um, Nevertheless, so this is now one uh, contender, and I see that a number of people in India take to it. Like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ashish, was it Kulkarni? Um, anyway, uh, some of the geneticists, you know, take to it. They say, well, genetically, everything falls into place. Mm. Uh, the linguistic argument, they don't know enough to see what the problems are. Uh, but so, I mean, I, I noticed that also in India, also among Aryan invasion skeptics, there are people who accept an Aryan invasion or an Aryan immigration uh, if it comes from northern Iran. Okay. So, so this is now an important contender. We have to take it into account. And um, I personally much prefer debating the out of India theory with the, you know, Iranian invasion theory than with the Yamnaya invasion theory. Okay, because at least this one is less uh, problematic than that one in, in terms of evidence. Well, um, no, it, 
It or more nothing, plausible. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the chauvinist Indian reason that I just sketched. I mean, that, you know, leaves me cold. Basically, these But, two are more plausible, so hence they can be, you know, uh, debated. Well, you see, <laughs> the, the people who now in the West, who now um, go with or feel inclined to this theory by Paul Hegarty, of a south of the Caucasus homeland, they have already converted away from the Yamla homeland. True, true. So it's just a matter of another clearly few hundred shows, kilometers Yeah, that to shows the an open-mindedness yeah. that in the debate against the Aryan invasion, I've been missing for 30 years. True. There was all this hate against the out of India theory. Exactly. And so th this scenario has become at least it is more geographically more closer. It's also to geographically debate. closer. Yes. Yeah. To Malab, both can be a plausible hypothesis. Yeah. So they will be more susceptible to, you know, accepting this yeah. as one of the plausible theories. Yes. And so um, among the signatories of the Hagerty paper, there are very important Indo-European linguists. Mm. So this is not, you know, a marginal thing thought of by just one scholar, because I can assure you that among linguistic scholars, you know, there are some strange ideas. Mm. Uh, but um, no, you see, this really is supported by a, a prominent body of Indo-European specialists. And as more and more work gets done on both linguistic and archaeology, as well as genetics, I think we will get closer to the truth. Yeah. You see, uh, 140 years ago or so, Max Müller came with his uh, famous hypothesis that the Aryan invasion, which was then agreed upon, but uh, yeah, that that took place in 1500 BC. But he later refuted himself. Like Well, no, he did not yet refute it immediately, but others around him, Now, it was very influential, you see, in, in the newspapers of those days, I'm sure it was front page news, ah, 1500 BC, the great Max Müller says so. Mm. And so, because of his uh, great importance culture, he was not some, some, some ivory tower scholar. He was very present. He was the general editor of the book series, Sacred Books of the East, mm. which, you know, Uh, Lao Tzu and Confucius and um, Nagarjuna and the Buddha and so on, they were all, you see, brought before the Western audience and all the Western philosophers and artists and so on could suddenly tap into the fabled, you know, wisdom of the Orient. And, and so Max Müller was a really big name. Mm -hmm. So if he said 1500 BC, then every non-specialist accepted it. True. But among specialists, there were doubts. And so people argued, well, this is, this is a bit late, you see. And, you know, even they had no archaeology yet uh, at the time uh, and so on, certainly no genetics. But at least, you see, if you look at the literature, you know, it's strange that a whole lot of contents-wise evolution from the Rig Veda down to the Buddha is all compressed into just a few centuries. Mm -hmm. And so his own pupil, uh, Moritz Winternitz, when he wrote a still influential book about Indian literature, he starts by, by saying that this Vedic literature must be older than, than Max Müller says. And so Max Müller, he, you know, The general public did not, but Max Müller himself took this criticism seriously. And so, at, you know, at, in the end, he gave up. He said, well, yeah, 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 I really have no evidence. This is just a guess. And we, we have historians till today who are repeating this 1500 BC but nonsense. But they all do. Yeah. And, and so when um, David Reich came with his, his findings, which I don't doubt, that there was an influx of people from Central Asia into India in around 1700 BC. Everybody said, oh, this, this is the Aryan invasion. Finally, the proof of the Aryan invasion. Yeah. Because they all took for granted the estimate that uh, Max Müller himself had retracted. Uh, 
So, you, I mean, that is a, a real weakness of the, the Aryan invasion party, that they, without any criticism, just still accept this wild guess. Let's see, hopefully the truth comes out in next few Well, dec- I am very optimistic yes. because at the end, you see, he threw his arms up in the air and he said, well, we will never know. But you we know? will know. But we, we are getting know. closer to sure. that. We're very close to it. Yeah. Just around the corner. Yeah. So thank you so much, sir, for giving such an enlightening discussion on I this so. thing. Because you are someone who has been following this debate for decades. Yes. And uh, hopefully we'll get to know soon because both uh, in genetics and linguistics work is going on. Yeah. Uh, And thank you so much for coming here and talking to us. Keep visiting India. And uh, next time when you are here by December, January, we will have a conversation on Ayodhya. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir.